the other new commissioner, um, Carpenter, that he can't be here until 7.30. He's got basketball? Basketball. Something. Yeah. So I think we can go ahead and start. All right. We'll go ahead and call the SK to Planning Commission meeting to order Thursday, January 26th, uh, about 7.02. Um, can we get a roll call? Yeah. Uh, so we got Commissioner Hartwig. Present. Commissioner Perkins. Not gonna be here. Commissioner Carpenter. It's gonna be late. Commissioner Sager. Here. Commissioner Hawks. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Uh, Chairman Wheeler. Here. All right. Uh, first thing, we have a new planning commission member, and we have one that's gonna be here a little bit later. You wanna give yourself a introduction and introduce yourself to the group? <laughs> My name's Antonio. Um, I don't know what to say. I'm just, I'm just, um, I'm really um, just pleased to be here. Uh, I, I come from New York State, Buffalo, New York, and I'm all the way in Oregon, and I'm sitting on this commission. It's pretty cool, man. I come a long way. We're glad so to have you. To Thank you. How long have you been in Oregon? Six months. Oh, whoa. <laughs> okay. Just made the time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> welcome. We're happy to have you. And we'll get uh, Commissioner Carpenter to introduce himself here whenever he shows up. Uh, first thing on the agenda is our approval of the December 8th, 2022 meeting minutes. I move to approve. Second. We, we got a motion. We got a second. Is there any discussion needed on this? Okay, all those in favor, let's raise our right hands. Okay, he's got us. Motion carries. Um, today's a little bit out of the ordinary for our planning commission. Normally we have public hearings and either subdivisions or annexations or planning related uh, items, but um, today we're actually got a couple of discussions. First of which is Child care zoning issues. And we had a little bit of a entry level discussion on this last meeting, I believe it was, about some of the hurdles within the SKA to city limits and greater community about this. So I'll let the planning staff take over and we can dive into this. Sounds good. And I don't know. Hi, Alan. Alan is another city planner who couldn't be here in person, um, who drafted this memo and did a lot of the background research and forming the memo. So there might be some questions that I've got to defer to him on, um, but I can start us off. Um, yeah, just sort of framing this conversation, catching people up who weren't there at the last conversation that we had. Although you might've, maybe that was when you attended, did we also do those interviews that evening? Yeah, so maybe you're already familiar, but um, yes, basically at that um, December meeting, you all heard from one of the childcare providers here in town about all the various um, you know, hurdles and barriers that there are to opening a childcare facility in the first place and then operating it. Um, some of those barriers obviously are out of the city's control. Um, some of those barriers are related to our regulations, our, and specifically our zoning regulations and like development code requirements. Um, and so at that meeting, you all kind of unanimously agreed this is something the city should take a look at. What are options that we have to reduce any barriers that we might currently have in our existing policies and codes? Um, reduce those barriers for childcare facilities. So we started taking, uh, the planning team started taking a little look into what do other cities do in terms of just allowing childcare in certain zones in their city, um, and also additional like programmatic things. And so you'll See in this memo, there's um, some information, there's some background information about just the childcare shortage in general. Um, and then 
looking at how Estacada currently regulates childcare facilities, and I'll go into that in a second. Um, and then looking at some options for changes that we could make that we expect just from our kind of preliminary review, we expect these types of changes at the bottom of the memo under alternatives. Um, those might be some good options for just expanding the opportunities for childcare facilities to be located somewhere, you know, opened and then um, reducing barriers to how they run or, you know, identifying maybe programmatic or incentive type, you know, support for them. So, but first, I, and you should all have this printed out in your packets in front of you. Mm -hmm. So if you go to, well, and I, I just want to stop there and see if Alan, did you want to chime in at all and say anything? I think that's a fantastic introduction. So we can just leave it at that for now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so looking on the second page at how Estacada regulates childcare facilities. Um, without having to read through, I mean, this is a pretty succinct summary here, but um, in case you don't want to read it, <laughs> basically our code is um, not only limiting, but it's also confusing. We don't have, we have um, a couple different definitions provided for or actually we just have one definition provided for a daycare facility. And then throughout the, the other sections of the code, like in the different zones, um, different wording is used to refer to daycare or childcare facilities. So you'll see daycare facilities in the definition, definition section. And then in one of the zones, it allows family daycare. And then in another zone, it allows childcare facilities, right? So it's not consistent in the, the wording that it's using. And if this wasn't, you know, government code, if this was just sort of a colloquial memo document, maybe it wouldn't matter. But when it comes to development code, it really matters that the wording, the word, the phrase that is defined in your definition section needs to precisely match <laughs> what's listed in the zone. So, so that's one easy fix is, all right, let's make sure that the wording is consistent. Um, next, there's the issue of, there are different types of childcare facilities. So we can have an in-home daycare that just serves, you know, six, maybe 10 kids and it's in someone's house, right? Um, and that is a state licensed daycare facility. Um, but they're only allowed to have a certain number of kids there. And obviously it's in someone's house. So those are the types of daycares that you would see allowed in residential zones in a city. There are other types of daycares that allow more children that are not usually um, you know, run out of someone's home. Maybe sometimes they are in some cities you'll see they'll allow as like a conditional use, they'll allow them to go you know, the next level up to one of the daycares that allows up to, I don't know, I'm making these numbers up, like 16 children, right? And the licensing procedure at the state is different for those different levels of, you know, the type of facility that you're running based on the number of kids that you're serving, maybe the types of um, programming that they run. Um, and I wish I knew more about that. I'm sure Brittany, who came to your last meeting, could probably talk a little bit about that. But um, that's something that through this process, we would want to look much more closely at what the different state categories and definitions for daycare types are and where those thresholds are. Um, and then just make sure that our code, you know, maybe we don't have to get too specific with matching it, but at least make sure that our code is not like accidentally prohibiting something because we didn't pay attention to how the state defines it or something like that. Um, okay, so, so there's the second problem is that there are these different types of daycare facilities that um, the state recognizes and our code doesn't really match up with you know, recognizing those different types. And then third, um, 
there are a number of zones that we have in the city that don't allow daycare. Either they don't allow it at all, or they only allow it as a conditional use. So it would have to go before the planning commission. Um, and as far as I'm aware, there's not been much conversation, certainly not in the past three and a half years since I've been here. Um, and I don't know, maybe you can tell me about before that, like when when is the last time that the city took a look at the zones where daycare is allowed and thought and talked to the community about um, you know, whether we want to change this. Do we want to allow daycare in more parts of the city? Does it make sense to allow daycare in the new riverfront commercial zone, for example, where there's other, you know, you could have, um, you know, other types of commercial uses. You could have institutional uses over there. Maybe it, maybe it wouldn't conflict with those other uses if there was a daycare in that zone too. So things like that, we're wanting to have this conversation and um, get your ideas about what parts of the city make sense to have a day to allow daycares, or at least where you don't see any conflict with there being a daycare there. I'm gonna pause there because I kind of just blurted out all my thoughts and maybe Alan will have <clears throat> more. I'm not really following the memo at this point. <laughs> so I have a couple comments and questions. So I know after we discussed it, it went to the city council and it kind of got bounced around the room. And it seemed like there were some city councilors that were initially saying, took the aspect of what is the city doing and getting involved with childcare? We don't want, uh, or we shouldn't be dealing with childcare. Or, or, and I'm not phrasing that correctly, but I don't think it's the planning commission's um, idea or plan to get into childcare, uh, i.e. subsidizing or creating a public private partnership somehow. Our job is to, do just what we're doing right now is talk about the code and figure out the regulations and how can we better uh, update that and create less barriers to entry so that we can potentially help the community with child care issues. So again, we're not in any way planning on subsidizing or at least I guess as a person and a, uh, as the chairperson, I don't, it's not my intent to subsidize child care or create a public child care that's run by the city. And I don't think we need to vote on that or anything, but I don't think that's anybody's intent. Um, second of all, when we start, or when you started talking, something came to mind. Uh, I think it was kind of in reference to child foster care. Do we need to dive into maybe adult foster care or anything like that? I mean, I, I don't know that that's come up, but since it's kind of fits in that same box, like as time goes on, maybe there'll be a need for that in the city. Um, we have somebody that has some experience with teen challenge. I know that doesn't fall into that box necessarily, but you know, that similar, similar in, in a lot of ways. So just a thought, um, I had one more and did, I, I got talking and lost it. So it'll come back to me, I promise though. So anybody else with any thoughts or questions? I agree with that. Position is what our job is not get into making things better for one group of people over everybody else. You know, it has to be equal for everyone. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's exactly right. We, um, at that council meeting, it seemed like there was a miscommunication or misunderstanding about what exactly the proposal was when we say the Planning Commission was recommending that the city look at options for removing barriers and, you know, better facilitating um, childcare facilities. Uh, it was not at all a proposal for the city to start providing childcare or to purchase a childcare facility right. for, you know, anything like that. Um, and so we could have made that clear. And I think a couple of the counts we didn't get to, they didn't get to go into much discussion, but it seemed like a couple of the counselors helped clarify exactly what you just said. We got, yeah, we got to a consensus on that, right. from that standpoint. Which okay. is, yeah, and, just looking at regulations. Right, and I think something that we talked about too is uh, looking at all regulations as well. You know, what, what can we do from a whole standpoint, not just child care. So, but this would be a great starting point to get us there. So yeah, if we wanna toss in, 
uh, adult care as well too. I, I see that as a growing need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just hit the tip of the iceberg on on just with I, with child care because it it expands not just to care for older people, middle aged people, and real old people like me. <laughs> New balance about <laughs> <laughs> I, think it, I believe it brought up a real bright spot. Um, when I came into Estacade, I seen the three schools and I was like, I didn't see any children. But one day I came out and like it was this thing going on over in the park by the school and it was a million kids. Also. I was like, oh my God, this is great. This town is live. This, this place is alive. Estacade is booming. And I don't see any, I, I mean, from from standpoint from coming from a, another city, I don't see any um, like um, I know the schools have after school things with um, like teen centers or, or um, places where they can go and um, they all can play or after school like a place for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I I really thought it brought up a real bright spot that after um, the meeting, people were thinking like in their minds. At least I was thinking like, well, this might cause something to spur. And people might bring something forward, daycare, even the young lady that presented her case, um, not so much as her solely, but um, for the whole Estacada to come together and maybe um, it maybe something might pop up. But my thing is this, is that it was a, a real bright spot. I mean, because like I'm driving around, I don't see any spots where um, children congregate or teenage, young teenagers can congregate and have a good time after a good time, excuse me, after school or whatever, at the teen center or whatever. But I'm sure that that can be done <laughs> um, through um, the zoning or whatever it is that, you know, we do. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just believe, I mean, I don't want to ramble, but I just, I, for me, I love kids. Um, and to see them grow in the neighborhoods they grew up in is awesome. As the kid is like that, I'm not from a small town, I'm from Buffalo, New York, it's really big um, to me. As in compared to New York City, it's small. However, um, there's a lot of a lot of um, teen centers and, and daycares. Like you go past and you see daycares, um, people homes with signs, and you know they're they're doing the daycare thing. Like it's plotted out here, um, but here it's not like that. I mean, I'm not saying the city is big, but it has a lot of people that do care. There's a lot of people. This is a working city. Um, I, when I came here, I was like, these people are doing great. <laughs> this town is not broke. People care. I mean, people are in a position to help other people achieve this goal. And I, I think it's a good thing. I really do. Yeah, that brings up, um, I think, a question that we should probably include in this you know, exploration um, is, yeah, what what types of facilities that are not necessarily daycares, not necessarily school facilities, but that are, um, I don't know what you would call it, sort of like youth supportive and recreational facilities, you know, a community center, for example, or um, yeah, other those other types of places where kids or youth, you know, high school age, um, kids can go to hang out or would go for their recreational activities or, or whatnot. Um, and yeah, does our current zoning allow for those facilities in the places that really make sense for, to the community to allow them? Yeah. Uh, my kids, <clears throat> one of them plays basketball, actually, uh, Ryan Carpenter's coach. And we've been playing tournaments at a place in Beaverton called Hoop Source. And as I, as I look at this matrix of zoning and what's allowed and what's not, as it pertains to daycares, it kind of, that was my other thought that I missed was this hoop source is a warehouse. It's in an industrial park. It has plenty of parking. The place is dead on the weekends because the, the businesses aren't open, right. but every weekend they host a tournament. Um, in my kid's age group, there was 14 teams one week, the most recent weekend, and he's just sixth grade, and there's fifth grade, and there's fourth grade, and there's eighth grade, and there's thousands of kids, it seems like, mm -hmm. and it's taken a, a, a otherwise, you know, booming place during the week, but on the weekends, it's now bringing this influx of people into there, and, and all the little cafes and
Starbucks is on the corners and Carl Jr. down the street are just crazy busy because you have all this. And I know that our zoning doesn't allow for very much flexibility with, as it pertains to the <clears throat> industrial. And it's for, you know, otherwise obvious reasons. You don't want kids running around while there's forklifts zooming past. But at the same time, if it's done in the right way and, it, and it's allowable, it could contribute well to a YMCA or a private entity to come in and put 17 basketball courts in and start hosting tournaments in, Est in little old Estacada. And because I mean, it's, it's people coming from Seattle and Idaho and California and Estacada and Scappoose. And I mean, it's, it's crazy. You're it's, probably staying in hotels. And... Yes. It's, it's absolutely bonkers. And these kids, parents, it's volleyball, it's everything. I and mean, it's just the way you sports are anymore. Everybody's diehard for this stuff and weekends you live and die by tournaments. And so, I mean, it's, it's something that, it would be neat if we could incorporate that too. I mean, we're, we're eating the elephant many bites at a time right now because we're talking about childcare, but it's spinning off and these other things. But it, I guess it speaks to that we also need to just look at our zoning code as a whole because it's we've added pieces as we've grown, but it's we haven't taken a big look at it. So again, I'm talking too much, guys. No. Oh, that's good. The agenda item is discussion. Need, so someone's got to talk other than me. Scouting 4-H or any of the other stuff that FFA. Yeah. FFA. Yeah. FFA. FFA. Yep. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess where do we go and, and what what do, how do we want to shape this conversation? Yeah. I okay, so um the other agenda item and we're not moving on to it yet but um you will next month you'll have a joint workshop with the city council that is really an open-ended broad look at um kind of visioning and growth management concerns and discussion for estacada it's super open-ended we're trying to make it a little less open-ended by asking you later in this meeting, you know, if there are specific topics. Um, but this is one of the topics that could get discussed further at that meeting, if you want to. Um, if not, or maybe in addition to that, I think the next steps here are um, start identifying what changes make sense to the zoning code in terms of where is daycare allowed? Where do we think it makes sense to allow it? And we could start really simple, just putting the types of daycares into two conceptual buckets in our mind, right? Small in-home type daycare versus larger childcare facility. Um, just start there and, and sit down together and look at the zoning map. We could start doing this a little bit tonight if you want to um, look at the zoning map and say, it yes, it makes sense to me to just allow any size of daycare outright in the downtown zone or the general commercial zone. Um, but I don't think daycares should be allowed in the industrial zone, obviously. Um, some of the zones, like the um the highway commercial zone, for example, that zone in my mind is I could I could see. It might make sense to allow it as a conditional use. Maybe a daycare would work there depending on what the neighboring uses were, but I could also see daycares conflicting with some of the other uses that are allowed in that zone. So that conversation, you know, we'll need to get, be thoughtful about where, where you're trying to put kids, <laughs> right? Um, you don't want to expose them to, um, you probably don't want a daycare next to somewhere that you could put a dispensary, for example. I think the state prohibits that anyway, but um, things like that, right? And so that conversation, I'm not sure if we wanna get too deep into that tonight, um, or if you want to schedule like a workshop to sit down and talk through that. Um, Maybe it makes sense to just go through right now and, and look at the matrix here with the daycare. I mean, as far mm -hmm. as, daycare as it's defined by our code, we don't make a delineation of in-home versus bona fide, like more commercial type, do we? Um, There's not really a delineation. It, it just, it, 
the thing that's confusing is that it makes this reference to the to the ORS to a chapter that doesn't really deal with daycare as we understand it it's it's more like institutional care for children like even like juvenile corrections and stuff so um it doesn't do that and it only limits um facilities to 12 max like 12 kids max so there's yeah there's there's not really a delineation between small and and larger facilities maybe that needs to happen first what what needs to happen De oh delineating delineate yes. between the two yep. and then run down your list like all of a sudden yeah so we de yes we definitely want to update the code to clarify that delineation um and then what but yeah what we could do we could go down um i could give a brief description of what types of uses are allowed in the zone that's shown there um and we could just talk about whether it makes sense, maybe there's, we're not sure, maybe there's disagreement, maybe everyone unanimously agrees that daycare should be allowed there, even though it's not, and we could kind of highlight those real quick. I, I have a question just from the, when Brittany was presenting, um, what are some examples, that refresh our memory, or, or that we could point to that, that are barriers currently? Um, what are the obstacles? Yeah. What? Yeah. Within Estacada's code, what are the obstacles? I, I think uh, just available space and uh, buildings that are available, and um, I think the call it the old True Value building, but it's been maybe it's been something since next to the Reliance Connects on Main Street. There, you know, it's a big open building, but you have to have a certain amount of exterior playground space, and it's got to be fenced and all these other things, and so. Yep. <clears throat> while the building itself is great, the lot doesn't lend itself to that. So then that one gets crossed off the list. And then there's like the forest service building, as you, I know as you brought up, um, and it sounded like the owner went by it on her possibly, but there was some certain barriers to that as far as lo maybe location, because it's part of the, the green zone. Oh, the, the riverfront commercial zone yeah. does not allow daycare, right? So it's it's a big building, and she would need partners to be to lease that, but at the same time, and then convert parking lot to playground or or whatever the conversation. And was. get a either a zone change or a code change to allow daycare in the first place, right? Or a conditional use of a particular building. Yeah, well, I'm not thinking of Boots and Spurs across the street, which has been empty for a while. They've got plenty of bathrooms. They've got upstairs. They've got downstairs. There's outside in the parking lot that you can put up all kinds of events for kids to stay active. Mm -hmm. Is it no for parking. sale? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I think that was part of the discussion of like each one of them had its unique problems, but not everyone had the same problem. Uh, and I, I, it, it kind of pairs with our multifamily um, housing problem of we have these areas delineated on the zoning map, but when you look at real life property, there's either a house on there where you have to buy the house and the property, and then you're working on a small piece of property, or it's the, the cost of development is not feasible right now, or it, it's just kind of each one of them has their own little idiosyncrasies, I guess. Yeah, and to add to the first um, the first example that you gave um, about maybe there's a, a property in the downtown zone that doesn't have enough outdoor space for what the state will require for a, ch a child care facility to have. Um, in the downtown zone, in most parts of the downtown zone, we actually have, it's not a minimum setback, it's a maximum setback. So in order to create the downtown feel, um, the code doesn't want you to set your building back farther than, uh, is it 10 feet maybe? Um, and those apply to the sides also. And I can't remember if they apply to the rear, maybe they don't. But, um, but that means that the building has to get built 
you know, it has to take up a certain amount of the lot. So that'll preclude certain um, childcare facilities. I think there's a building for sale right now that um, that that uh, person was looking at and they couldn't do it because there's not enough outdoor space. Stuff like that, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of a um, maximum required setback as being a barrier to childcare facility until you hear from childcare providers that, oh, we have to have this much outdoor space and, you know, all these downtown mm -hmm. buildings don't have that because they were built to the code. So that'd be another thing to factor in is, is uh, how, how can we be more flexible with that if mm -hmm. a childcare facility were, yeah, were yeah. brought to, to the city? Right. Like would, you know, it would be worth exploring would, would we want to allow an exemption from certain code requirements for childcare facilities specifically? So. I've been listening and thinking about everything you all said. My mind just went, I said, you know what? We've just about maxed them right out of the city, no matter what we do without an exemption. And it might be easier just to take a piece of property just barely outside the city, down private land that has a huge barn with lots of bath <laughs> and a big bunch of horses to go play with. Yeah, thank you. You know, it, it sounds like because we've got we've got an influx of kids gonna need childcare. And I read in this that we have to stay with under 13. Now is that for one household or for one daycare itself of any size? Right now, that's just one facility. It can't have more than 12 kids. Wow. See, Tom, that's just about taking up your whole house. Mm -hmm. City or state guideline? That's the city's current definition of a daycare facility. Is there a minimum square footage in a house to have 12 kids? Not in our code, but in okay. the state, I think the state's you requirements. You do it in a one room. Right, right. Yeah, you have to have a certain amount of square footage per kid. And, and certain a certain square. number of caregivers too. Yeah, that's, I think that's all state. Right, right. Regulated. As far as the school properties, this kind of goes out the window though. Obvious, well, I don't want to say obviously because it's not obvious, but um, classrooms have one teacher and 25 kids mm -hmm. and then there's some preschools on, or some daycares on the school property that obviously don't abide by this so i'm assuming that they don't have to fall into that bucket which i, I just know, keep, stop not, talking yeah the city the city is not the <laughs> the regulating agency so i'll just we'll just not <laughs> share that information with the state um yeah um, so there's no square footage for each child in a facility to run and play or just go like this. I think there is a your elbow. State, from the state at the state level, there is. State level. Well, yeah. COVID, COVID is there and there. <laughs> 35 square feet was COVID. Yeah. Not 36, which was six by six. It was 35, which yeah. is really weird. So short arms. So. Yeah. <laughs> um so. I don't know. I guess we could go, we could go down a hundred different rabbit trails, but I guess we should find a direction, right? Yeah. Um, well, if if everyone's okay with it, maybe we could take. I don't know if we'll go end up going down a rabbit hole, but maybe we could try to do this sort of quickly, not getting into too much discussion, but kind of just do a pulse check, go down this list. Um, I'll give super brief description of the zone and what it allows. Um, and hear from you guys whether you think it makes sense to allow small and or large child care facilities in that zone. Does this have to be done through the city council? The so, code, yeah, yeah. so okay. the um, recommendation to go to the council. Initiating the code, a code amendment or initiating a comprehensive plan amendment, those are both legislative decisions, um, those can be initiated by either the planning commission or the city council. Um, and so you all had the first discussion on this back at your last meeting. Um, so you're technically the 
you are the decision-making body that's initiating this amendment, but the ultimate decision on any code changes or plan changes would be made by the city council after your recommendation. Okay. So. Say so we recommend, we never just make a decision. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> one other thing that's worth talking about since we have uh, at least one new member here, we have two different maps in front of us, uh, zoning and comprehensive plan. The zoning is the current status as of a snapshot of today, right? Yep. The zoning map shows um, everything that's within city limits is shown in color. And then all of the areas that are shown inside of that red dotted line, um, that's all within the urban growth boundary. So all of that land is eligible and kind of expected to come into city limits eventually, but all of the properties that are still white within that red dotted line are not yet annexed into city limits. So it gets complicated, but you'll you'll look at this map probably more than you would like to over, <laughs> over the next couple of years. Um, and you'll kind of get used to it. But yeah, so the zoning map is where if you want to see what the current city limits are, it's everything that's shaded in color on the zoning map. And then your comprehensive plan map um, shows the color shading for all of the properties that are within the urban growth boundary. So that shows you um, when a property does eventually come into city limits, what is the zoning that's going to apply to that property? So that's the comprehensive plan map. Yeah. And if you have questions um, about anything and everything related to zoning and comprehensive planning and the statewide land use planning laws, you're always, all of you are always welcome to contact us in the planning division. Our brains are full of too much of that information. We like to get it out. <laughs> um, Okay, so let's maybe go down this list and you've got the zoning map in front of you so you can try to follow along. Um, we could, Paul, would you like a copy of the comp plan and zoning maps? We've got them already printed out, I yeah, think, sure. in the office, yeah. yeah there's, um, some, there's, a, there's a couple of them on the on the right side of the, of the table, or at least the right right from the way I'm looking at it. Are there two maps there that are free? Um, he, Brian's going to show up a little bit late. So oh, we'll that's right. Leave those that's there. right. Yeah. And just to, um, while we're waiting, just to brag a little bit about Alan and our new GIS program, um, we are in the process of bringing GIS, the mapping system, geographic information system, um, for all time. We've always had the county do all of our mapping services for us, which is great, but um, also creates challenges. You know, we have to do a lot of coordination and back and forth if we want to get anything updated. And so we're bringing all of that in-house. And so we'll have lots of mapping capabilities in maybe a year. <laughs> um, but this is, these updated maps are uh, one of the first of our, you know, to come out of our new GIS system. Thank you to Alan for that. Thanks. Um, okay, so going down the list uh, in table one, the first zone is R is the R1 zone. That's the lowest density residential zone. It does allow daycare facilities. And so that means it allows a facility up to 13 kids. We'll consider that, or sorry, up to 12 kids. We'll consider that the smaller daycare facility. And so those facilities would be um, in-home daycare facilities. And then as a conditional use, it looks like, what does this asterisk mean? Oh, so the conditional use daycare facility that's allowed in the R1 zone is that, um, you know, child welfare type facility. Right. So kind of my understanding is the reason they delineate it between the two, just regular old daycare, and then the as defined in ORS chapter 418 is that 
those were more for institutional facilities or, you know, for um, like institutional foster care and maybe even juvenile corrections. I'm not really sure. There's a lot of um, different uses that fall under that ORS chapter. So um, I think that's the distinction, but the R code doesn't really do much to kind of tease them apart other than just making this reference to that chapter. So um, that's, yeah, that's what it looks like for these residential zones. Mm -hmm. Taylor, would they be also uh, required to stay at the 12 child limit? Well, that's up to you all and the city council. Oh, you mean the- um, Under the conditional use. The child welfare facility? Yeah, child welfare. Sure. Maybe Alan knows. I'm not sure. Saying, just according to the definition, it, it it's it's a kind of unclear, but it says daycare facility, meaning a facility accommodating fewer than 13 children, blah, 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 or meeting the definition and standards as contained in ORS 418. So I think that maybe those, that use is not constrained by the under 13 limit. Hmm. So but again, they could Taylor's have right. It's, it, it depends. Yeah, it could have more. Um, but yeah, I think like Taylor said, I think it just depends on the interpretation of, of planning commission and council. Is that appropriate for a residential area? And that's the question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you made You're going to go a whole bunch of NIMBYs, not in my backyard. Right. <laughs> you just made the full circle. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, so does the existing, so basically the existing allowance in that zone is smaller in-home regular daycare facilities, um, or you could get a conditional use permit from the Planning Commission to allow that more institutional type facility that might be larger than 13 children, but we would find that out at the Planning Commission hearing for the conditional use. Hello. <laughs> Yep. We might as well make an introduction since you're yeah. walking in here. This is uh, Ryan Carpenter, our second newest member to the uh, Planning Commission. You want to give a Reader's Digest version of uh, why you're here and uh, introduce yourself? Well, welcome to everybody. I think I know most people around the room, but it's a pleasure to be here. I apologize to be late. On top of work, I'm also a sixth grade basketball coach. And so we just uh, finished practice and hustling down, but I'm excited to be a part of this team. Uh, very much looking for the opportunity to participate in the future and the future growth of Estacada. And I also want to introduce, this is Dane Carpenter and he's my seventh grade son. And uh, so uh, he wanted, he volunteered uh, to come and watch and be a part of this process. So I'm happy to have him. Uh, easy on the, the bag wrapper there, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll stay quiet. <laughs> we won't we won't put a microphone up to him. So just to get you up to speed, we're going through uh, daycare facilities in the city of Escada. Great. And right now we're diving through the allowable areas that they are. Um, we can have them currently. Yep. So. And so we're in the, there's a child care memo in the packet that should be printed out at your table. And we're on page two of that memo. And um, so we're looking at the zones. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, you got a bunch of the, our, our new people got um, the planning commissioner handbook. So you got a bunch of stuff on your tables there. Thank you. Um, yeah. And then- Oh, Paul's got a question. Oh, sorry. I, I'm, I'm going back to, uh, uh, Commissioner Hawk's question here about uh, the size, the 12, 12 people in an R, R1 or any of the R zones, um, is there normal and customary? I mean, is, is there something we can look at that other cities do is it, the, yeah. that we can uh, kind of see what's worked and what's not worked? Any, any idea there? Or could that be found? It can definitely be found, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any requirement for some kind of fencing around people can't get in, people can't get out to these facilities? Currently, no, but um, that is something that you could adopt into your development code. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking outside the house now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can yep. you tell? And that's something that, you know, we don't, we haven't 
had enough of a chance to um, take a deep dive into the state requirements. So that might be another thing that the state addresses, just like they address how much square footage do you need per child. Um, they might address things like fencing or whatever they would call it, but. My great grandkids can outrun grandpa and grandma. <laughs> so yeah, I've got, um, yeah, look into what's normal in other jurisdictions in terms of in their, the safety. in their residential. And I, I guess maybe that question is basically in their zones that are um, strictly residential, like our R1 zone, especially in their <laughs> low density residential zones. Um, what's normal? How do they limit the size of the daycare facilities that they do allow in those zones? So we can look into that and kind of get a cross section of what various other so it may places already do. be a requirement or something. Just not by our city. Um, were there any other thoughts on, yeah, do, do, does anyone feel like we should allow um, or might want to allow larger daycare facilities? Maybe it's not one of the institutional child welfare facilities, <laughs> but, um, as a conditional use in the low density residential zone, you could also allow those larger daycare facilities that are above 13 children. Is that something you wanna look into? Does it feel like a, does that just feel like an immediate no? I think I might stay away from that just, just by virtue of neighborhoods and you know, people. Yeah. Tend to get a little excited. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would also go along with that. I mean, if you're going for lots and lots of kids, you're going to need a school building or of size to handle it. The, the, the young lady, she said they bumped up to what, eighty-four. Yeah, like that. Yeah, that's tremendous. It's a lot of kids. That's a lot of space. The only the the immediate thought that goes through my head is no, but. <clears throat> All of the school grounds are overlaid in the R1. And I, I mean, obviously, we have kids there all day long during the week. And there's a fair amount of little parcels that are R1 that aren't necessarily residential areas. Um, mm -hmm. we, we could, I could go through and point a few out. The piece of ground across from Granny's. <clears throat> for instance, is two acre piece that's, you know, not any immediate neighbors there, but it is zone R1 and could lend itself due to its proximity to say the library and the school or the school buildings, yeah, bus lines and that, that sort of stuff that it, it could be a prime spot for something like this. Mm -hmm. And I know we could always get in the ifs and whats and all that stuff, but I don't want to say a hard no until we're there. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a great point. The, the school is on, all, the, all of the schools are on, are in the low density residential zone and they are allowed there as conditional uses. Um, and as with any conditional use, you can either write it into your code or during the public hearing, you can decide to apply conditions like um, they have to, they have to put fencing. They have to set back the buildings farther than a normal house or something would have to set, you know, set back in that zone. So when you say set back, set back farther from the road? Farther from the road, farther from the property line. You know, with a conditional use approval, you have more discretion to apply those extra requirements. Case so, by case. Right. And so if you're thinking about... Um, yeah, just like you were just now thinking, well, you know, you're maybe putting a daycare in a neighborhood and a residential area, you've got people living there, you can, you can, you were starting to imagine all these potential impacts and conflicts. And so that's where, um, through the conditional use process, you can decide to apply requirements and restrictions that would um, prevent those conflicts or those impacts. 
just looking at uh, looking up some some Oregon guidelines here. This this may give some good perspective, but if I'm looking at this right, there are three kinds of childcare uh, facilities recognized in Oregon: registered family childcare, certified family childcare, and then certified childcare center. Registered family childcare is maximum of ten; should be in a provider's own home. Certified maximum twelve, which lines up with our numbers and in a uh, single family home. And then certified childcare is in a commercial facility. Mm -hmm. So if we did allow something like that in, in one of our residential areas, it would be have to be a commercial facility. It couldn't just be somebody turning a home, if I'm reading this right, into, a, into something that would allow more than 12. What was the third one called? Certified Child Care Center. Center. Maybe we can. Um, I think you read that right, Paul. And and I guess is if this is our current standard, if um, if in town, if I read C one and C two as commercial and R C as residential commercial, is that correct? C two is residential commercial and R C is riverfront commercial. Oh, okay. Either way, it looks like if a if a if a number three were to come in like a kinder care or some type of an organization that currently the city would prohibit their ability to access commercial storefronts mm -hmm. uh, and, and in order to offer that business, which yeah. is something that should be considered, mm -hmm. um, especially as the demand grows. Also, I was gonna point out in the residential one and two, like uh, Mr. Wheeler talked about, you know, if we think about it, there are daycares happening all over and our ones currently both in compliance and out of compliance. And what I look at, and that includes a lot of our churches who are inside residential facilities who offer everyday daycare to the people who are a part of those congregations. And in addition to, I also think about the Red Barn preschool, and there's another preschool that's on whatever it is uh, next to uh, Clackamas River Elementary School that also houses far more than 13 kids. And the difference between a daycare and a preschool isn't actually that significant when you think about the co-op perspective of how preschools work in those organizations and the curriculum that goes along with it. So you can say we're already out of compliance with that <laughs> by a lot. Yep, agreed. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know if we wanna move on through the other residential zones, there are some differences. Um, obviously, as you go up in the R numbers, it gets denser. So R2 is medium residential. R3 is, sorry, medium density residential. R3 is the multifamily zone. Um, and in all three of their zones, the same types of daycare, you know, the same type of maximum 12 kid daycare is allowed outright. And then as a conditional use, you could have that institutional child welfare type of daycare. Um, but if you think about a multifamily area, if you've got a, an apartment, if you've got apartment buildings in an area, um, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but I imagine a larger daycare facility making more sense in right. that type of place. Um, as, as we get into North City Residential, that's that's the NCR, right? Uh huh. <clears throat> and that's pretty much the most recent annexations and subdivision subdivision applications up Eagle Creek Highway and Deuce Road, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a mix of everything, because it has we do have multifamily slated for the further furthest northern portion of Eagle Creek Highway before it exits the city limits. Mm hmm. But here we don't even allow it as a conditional or an allowed use. Right. And that zone, so the NCR zone is one of the six new zones. Some of you remember this. Um, the six new zones that were created in 2020. And um, we've already noticed some kind of, I don't want to call them typos, but you know, omissions. Or, you know, it seems like, and this is inevitable, I'm not blaming anybody, but, um, you know, some things just weren't considered in the creation of those zones. We can't think of everything, um, but uh, it might be worth adding in some allowed uses that 
probably would have made sense to allow in, just nobody thought of them at the time. Um, and so, yeah, North City Residential um, is probably one of those zones. Why, why do we allow, actually in the NCR zone, well, I guess this is one of the places where it gets confusing. Daycare facility is not allowed outright in that zone, but family daycare provider, this is one of the examples, family daycare provider is allowed in that zone, but then we don't have a definition of what family daycare provider is. Um, so, and if we just assume that family daycare provider falls under the same um, definition that we have in our code in the definition section, then we have to limit it to 12 kids. Um, so the question here is really, do you want to allow both the 12 child type of um, facility and the larger, um, what was it, the child care center type of facility that is more of a commercial type of use? And if that answer is yes, then, you know, you want to look at in that zone, um, multifamily Multifamily is only allowed within 200 feet of Eagle Creek Road because they wanted to put it close to the bus line. And so is that something that you would also maybe just allow that larger facility within that same 200 feet? Maybe it could be a ground floor, um, ground floor daycare in the apartment building that they build there, something like that. A lot goes into this. Yeah, because as, especially as we discuss the annexations and, and the actual subdivisions, they have lots delineated generally, and then we had the blocks of the multifamily. So trying to fit something that had potentially a bigger footprint as, as one of these child care centers would, you know, that'd have to be either re, a, a rezone and you're taken away from that multifamily more than likely, or you're trying to stuff it in with residential essentially right mm -hmm. if, yeah, I some... just, if i just heard ben right you're saying if you've got all these communities of multi-residences and stuff and you're wanting to make a commercial building or a child center which one of them has to have a conditional use permit because it won't be an outright use it could in the zone immediately next to that one uh, which is the central mixed use zone, CMU, in that zone, it's a mixed use zone, right? So you can have both commercial and residential uses intermingled in that zone. In that zone, it explicitly allows outright, you can have ground floor commercial uses and upper floor residential uses. And so um, the North City residential zone could be amended to allow similar a similar mix of uses. Um, but maybe you would want to, I mean, it's up to the, it's all up to you all in the council, um, but maybe it would make more sense to um, only allow certain types of commercial uses. We're right. only suggesting a place that they might think of it. Right. We're not going to build it. We're not going to buy it. Right. We're yeah. not going to run it. It's just allowing it. It's if someone, if some it. private entity Thank can you. make it happen, the city would allow it to happen, basically. Wouldn't stop it from happening. That's about as far as we want to go, I think. Reducing the barriers. Yep. Okay. Almost all of this can be subject to conditional use too. I mean, they can apply. If campaign. it's listed, yeah. If yeah, it is listed, listed as a conditional use, then they can always ask. Right. Um, but it has to get listed as a conditional use first. Otherwise, if it's not listed as an outright use and it's not listed as a conditional use, it is assumed, the way that our code works is it is assumed to be prohibited. Um, yeah, so I wanna do a time check and pulse check here. Um, we're about, we're an hour in to the meeting and we could continue going down through the zones here, or we could think about um, what this, how you want this process to move forward. Do you want, would it be 
helpful to to do this in more of like a workshop work session type setting where we like get out our zoning maps and may or maybe print out like big posters and we can tack sticky mm -hmm. notes on there or draw where we think things should or shouldn't be allowed. Um, do you want to make sure that this topic comes up in your joint workshop with the city council next month? Kind of get their direction where they want to go. Well, I have a question. Is that an open meeting for the people Public. that want to build it, make it happen? That's a workshop, so it won't it won't involve any public involvement. It'll be a discussion between just between you all and the city council, and we will be there, you know, helping answer questions as we can. But it it's really going to be a pretty open discussion. Um, I think it definitely should be discussed. Yeah, and the issues would be the childcare facilities, and in that would zone change. In the joint workshop, yeah, we're going to talk about that next. We have a we have a long <laughs> list of <laughs> issues that you could focus on. Um, uh -huh. so you want to get your insight on that? Would it be possible? I mean, for me, this is this is overwhelming um, to think about, and I admire you know you guys for digging into this stuff uh, day in day out. Um, would it seems like I I know I could use an education on on child care. Um, you know, just kind of seeing that there are already different, three different types of classifications in Oregon, just to get up to speed on that, would there be a resource that could come and talk to us, someone from Clackamas County, um, maybe that could talk about what different cities are doing within the area as well, too? I mean, I don't, I don't know, this is, this is just my thoughts here, but. Um, All kinder care. There is a county program called Preschool Promise, and um, I've been looking at how to get in touch with them as as a as city staff just to see what it would take to establish something like that in Estacada. Um, as part of that outreach, I could ask them if they would be willing to come and speak to planning commission and and or city council about that. That's a good idea. Ryan, do you have any assets that? would be helpful from the school district or the county ESD or any of that side of things? Potentially the ESD, but uh, the, the daycare game is kind of out of our wheelhouse um, from that perspective. I would be curious to hear, uh, particularly from cities who have experienced this growth already and how they manage that. I think of young, young uh, cities who are emerging that require that, you know, like a Sherwood or um, a happy valley, or not that we want to be those people necessarily, but I know that they have an influx of that demographic of family moving in that has a Hillsboro, sure. Yeah. Whatever we do, if this is successful, Commissioner Wheeler could be the one visiting other cities <laughs> about what SDK to do. I, I would volunteer to go with it. That sounds fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you for that appointment. Yeah. It's an honor and privilege. <laughs> Place in Vegas. Yeah. I, I think you're, uh, Commissioner Strobel, I think your idea is a good one that there are people who have gone through this path before. And it makes sense not to have to reinvent any wheels for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, what I'm hearing is we'll look into can we get maybe it's a presentation, maybe it's just a package of information, not that you want more things to read <laughs> but um, it'd be great to yeah to hear from someone who you know whether it's a county person or a you know program manager or coordinator who's got an understanding of how cities you know other regions or cities are dealing with these issues now they go ahead and navigate it because it looks like there could be some real stumbling blocks mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the language has to be figured out. We don't, you don't have the language in your code that will match everything else. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem. If you get in the, in the argument with the state, you're going to lose. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we will look into that. And for some of the um, 
just thinking about how to keep it, keep this moving forward if possible. For some of the changes that seem uh, a little more like common sense and obvious, um, we could go ahead and draft up some, some of those proposed changes. Um, and even changes that we're not quite sure about, maybe it would be easier for you all to respond to something in, in front of you rather than us saying, what do you want to change, right? Yeah. Um, so we could go ahead and draft up some potential changes for you to look at and respond to, talk to the council about, um, and at the meantime, have whatever informational resource and contacts where we can get a hold of. Um, get them scheduled sometime within the next couple of months, if possible. That sounds good. And I think at the end of the day, I think the biggest thing is, is as a commission, we're, our job is just to hopefully clean up the code, recognize the issue we have, and then try to create a clear path for whoever that private or pseudo government agency that's not us um, will be able to accomplish the goal of creating more childcare opportunities in the um, area. So I, we can get into the weeds and all the regulations. And I think the more clear and concise and, and maybe less is more of, you can do it here, conditional use this. We're not gonna get into defenses and setbacks and all that stuff. We'll leave that to the state because they've already probably got it lined out. Mm -hmm. But I think just create that clear path so that people can have that opportunity to at least explore it. I think that's where my, my energy would, like to see us focus on. <clears throat> okay. okay, so with that, we'll put that to, <clears throat> to bed. put it put it to bed for now, and then uh, go into the next one of joint workshop topics. Unless anybody, else, I, don't, I don't want to cut anybody off. If anybody's got any last remarks on this, but okay, let's go ahead and jump into the next one then. The joint workshop topics, and that'll be with the city council in the month of February. Yes, so that is going to be held on, and I'm, I expect this won't work for everyone's schedule, and I apologize, but they meet on Mondays, and so that's going to be um, held on Monday, February 27th. So I hope that most of you will be able to make that. We'll ask you for an RSVP sometime closer to the date. Um, so in your packet, you should have a printed out another memo called, I don't know what to call it. It's called the State of the Estacada Municipal Code. <laughs> and um, this is basically just a list that we have been building over time. And when I say we, this is across lots of different city staff. So this is not, not just planning staff, but um, code enforcement, the city manager's office, the city recorder's office. All of us have to deal with, you know, applying different parts of the municipal code. And so as we do that, we run into part, places in the code where there's some issue. There's maybe a gap where there should be a requirement that isn't there and it's messes up some process because we're not able to require something of an applicant that we really should be able to require. Um, or there are places in the code where the code conflicts with itself. There are, I think, multiple zones where there's a use that's, pro that's listed as prohibited and it's also listed as a conditional use, right? So things like that, that we should really clean up. Um, and the kind of bigger things, um, like, um, for example, I'm just looking down this list. Number four, requiring park space in subdivisions. Our code currently does not actually require any provision of open park space if you're doing a residential subdivision. When you have a small subdivision, maybe it's not that big of a deal, but we've got these huge, like 224 lot subdivisions coming in and they are not required by our code to put in park space, um, which seems like an oversight, right? And I think when we've had these conversations, everyone tends to agree there should be something there, right? We should either, maybe it's requiring a certain amount of space per acre developed, or if you're not gonna require or provide park space, you pay into the park fund, something like that. Um, just get something in our code, right? That's making sure that the city has the ability to provide park space for all of these residents that are coming in. Um, so 
this list is not by any means, you know, we're not, we're not saying that you have to discuss these things at your joint workshop next month, um, but these are issues that staff are aware of that are problems that we need to address in our code sometime ideally over the next few years. Um, that and maybe some of them will jump out to you as you know kind of higher priority in your mind or maybe some of them you have questions about and want to talk through right now or maybe there's something that you don't see on this list that is a concern that you're having about the way the city is growing or um yeah just how the city's growing um what issues are you anticipating in the future that you think we need to address now? Things like that. I apologize, we're asking really open-ended questions today. I know that's not super easy. But. No, Paul's right. This is a, a lot of stuff to digest and to, <clears throat> it's gonna have to take more than one time, I'm sure. Yeah, and we are we are including this list um, in the city council's. We're actually including it for their information in their goal setting packet. They're going to do their goal setting workshop this weekend on Sunday, um, so they will also have this list in front of them, and so they'll be aware of all of these issues that we um, are recommending they consider. Um, Maybe what would be helpful is we just start going down the list and hearing any thoughts that you all have about or questions that you have about each item. I have one uh, and it just, because <clears throat> planning and growth kind of is our main wheelhouse. The consistent comment or complaint is traffic's getting bad. Why are you guys letting the city blow up? in the Happy Valley or Sandy or insert your favorite city you hate in this comment. Um, from a planning commission standpoint, I, I think there's a understanding that, or there's a misunderstanding that we're just pushing this growth. And I think, and I don't know how to explain this to the greater city, but our job is to look at these applications and these land use issues through a specific lens as defined by the state and the city code. Um, and so there's a limited amount of stuff we can do, but to kind of get into the the growth and the traffic impact part of it, like how do we get a hold of ODOT and say you need to come and sit here and listen to this and help us deal with the traffic? Because we can deal with the dotted line at the top of this map, but everything beyond that is Clackamas County and then the state of Oregon. And so how do we, like? I guess as proactive as possibly get them involved so it doesn't end up being like a Dundee and Newburgh situation where people just hate going over to that side of town and then whatever it is 35 years later they finally do a bypass um, or improve the highway to a point where it can actually control the traffic so and that's a that's a big issue yeah and I don't know how to do it because they obviously don't care that much because they don't come here but how do we kind of get over that hump and get them here that's a million dollar question. I would love to know the answer to that question too. <laughs> We're working with ODOT, um, with some folks at ODOT currently on updating our transportation system plan, which we're in the middle of that project. Um, for transportation facilities that are within our urban growth boundary, we get to set basically the, um, the threshold at which we no longer, you know, tolerate the traffic, right? So um, I forget, I'm forgetting what it's called. Maybe it's level of service. Um, basically, we get to decide how much congestion are we willing to tolerate. And we get to set that level, allowable level of congestion in our um, code calculation for level of service. And so um, when we require these traffic impact studies for subdivisions or other types of development, um, the traffic impact study will show, we'll use that methodology that we've agreed is the tolerable amount of congestion. Um, and they have to they have to scope their traffic impact study according to that calculation. And so that is 
I say that and maybe some of you are thinking, oh, well, let's just, you know, lower the amount of congestion that we're willing to tolerate, but there's all sorts of, um, I don't know, maybe that's the way that, maybe that's the way that you want to go. And I'm sure that there's a limit to that too, right? The state firmly protects <laughs> the right for residential land to get developed. And so I don't know what the limit is there, but, um, but there is an opportunity for the city to, um, to be more strict and intolerant of congestion created by these developments. But that only is but within only our within city our limits, right? Right. So all of the, I think what you were talking about mostly is all of the traffic happening on the highway, which obviously as Estacada grows, the highway is the primary way in and out of the city. And we don't have any control really over that transportation facility. I don't have a good answer. It's not a good that. answer. Is River Mill Road, is that the city limits? Yes. That is the boundary, isn't it? No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, Deuce and then is it Ely Road? No, it's before Ely. I guess there is no road there. Parts of River Mill Road are in city limits and parts are not in city limits. But it is particularly that right hand turn onto the old Eagle Creek Highway from River Mill. Does that belong inside the city? It, that it just, intersection. It recently yes. was talked about. And so they're going to put a stoplight, a traffic signal there. Oh, great. Okay. I'd say that's. And I think the developers yeah. run, run the money for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but the next problem is going to be River Mill and the highway. Right. Correct. That's yeah. ODOT. And that's ODOT. Got it. Yeah. And so that's one, so that is within our urban growth boundary. So that's one intersection that we do have identified in our TSP currently as we anticipate needing a traffic signal there. Um, and I don't expect that to change with this TSP update, um, but part of this process is making sure that ODOT is sufficiently involved and kept up to speed as we update our TSP um, and kind of checking in with them on whether or not there are any, there seem to be any like potential roadblocks to the city planning for that improvement to happen because ultimately ODOT's going to have to permit that traffic signal to get put in there. And in order for them to, um, to allow it to get put in, it has to get adopted into their state, what is it, state transportation improvement plan. Um, and in order for it to get into that plan, we have to meet a certain number of trips going through that intersection. So, but, and it has to be in the city's TSP. So we got that down, right? It's in our TSP, we need it. ODOT is aware that it's in our TSP. We just are not yet at that trip count. And unfortunately we have no control over the thresholds that ODOT will, right? They will tolerate a lot more congestion than most people want mm -hmm. to have in their city or on their highway. <clears throat> that intersection will be built uh, by the state. So this is their highway. They will take care of that light. That is a complicated question. I don't know. There's no will. It's usually, point. yeah, there, it depends on, I think it, I think it's a combination of um, buckets of money. And if the, if the city is able to, if the city is able to generate, you know, through SDCs or some other, or even, you know, grant, if there's a grant opportunity or something like that, like it could get built by other mechanisms. Um, but if not, then I think have getting it included in the state's transportation improvement plan is like, that is the the latest possible, like that'll take the longest basically, um, but then it gets paid for by the state, I think. Yeah. And then Someone who maintains it? And then, sorry? The maintenance of it. Usually there's a, an agreement between the state and the city for the city to maintain the facility to a certain degree. And some of that maintenance, depending on what the maintenance needed is, some of that has to be done by the state. Mm -hmm. And just kind of bringing us back to this as well, too, um, you know, they're at the table for the transportation plan. So that's ODOT is. So that's good. They, they, they're they hearing the growth. They know what's going on here. But um, going back to what you were saying about the role of the planning commission is basically uh, 
to approve, you know, see if it meets the, the subdivisions, the annexations, see if they meet the criteria. We had a great session, I thought, on Monday with city council. We had a city council workshop. It's up on YouTube now, especially for our newer members here. I would encourage you guys checking it out. Our, our lawyer met with us and told, talked to us about the roles of the council, and it would extend to the planning commission as well, too, when it comes to the land use decisions that, um, what, what was the word? Our, we, we aren't here to decide, should we grow? Um, we are here as a quasi-judicial role. Does the does the application meet the criteria? And that's that's the role. But part of the discussion that we had, um, and it's kind of interesting to hear, is is what kinds of things can we change? But out of it came there is opportunity to tighten some of those um, codes that we have, and that's kind of what we're hoping to accomplish with the joint session coming up here, what what can we do? What What is within our control? And it sounds like any comp plan changes that we have need to be approved by the state of Oregon. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but we're limited from that standpoint too. Um, I think as, as Peter said, it's this is a bad way to put it, but it's stacked against us um, to turn anything down because the, the state wants the, we are in a housing crisis, I think is what it's considered. So the state wants growth. We've got the urban growth boundary. Um, so things, if, if, if it meets the criteria, it can grow within that. But what can we do as a group to really address the criteria and make sure we got the right criteria in place? And that's a good opportunity for us, I think. Yeah, and one of the things, one of the things that came up in that conversation is relates to the first item on this list here, which is that um, currently our approval criteria, so our code requirements for subdivisions or any residential land development um, are not clear and objective. There's a lot of subjectivity in our code for residential development, and that is illegal. <laughs> and there are certain parts of our code that if we tried to you know, impose those requirements, we would be vulnerable to lawsuit, it would get could get taken to the Land Use Board of Appeals and returned, or LUBA will just make the decision for you. Um, and so um, that is one that is one big need that I see, right? We're kind of vulnerable to legal trouble if we don't fix our code just to, to meet that minimum legal requirement for residential development. But um, the other opportunity there is if we if we are going in and we're going to update our code to make sure that it is clear and objective as the state defines that, which they do define it. Um, you, I heard this recently from one of the DLCD head honcho guys, um, is that your code does have to be clear and objective, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be easy or lax, right? Um, you just have to have a clear and objective path for a developer to come in and know how to develop their land. And so um, there are plenty of cities throughout Oregon who have um, stricter development requirements. For example, I'm thinking of, um, I know Sandy has their kind of like Sandy design brand that is adopted into their code. That's more for commercial buildings, but um, yeah, you can increase certain requirements for residential development, um, but still make them clear and objective and be meeting state law. And so it just might be worth looking into, you know, are we, are we booming with development and some of that development is not coming in and looking or, um, functioning the way that is appropriate? Um, well, let's look at our code and see what could be changed to ensure that it actually is kind of meeting the community's hopes and needs for growth. Have those things been identified? Some of them have been identified. I mean, some of them, it's really just as we go through and review these subdivision applications, we will struggle to, um, to, base, to identify whether a criteria is met or not because the criteria itself is not it requires discretion. And so there are certain oh. approval criteria that 
basically we, you know, we come to the public hearings and we're deferring to you all, or we're deferring to the city council to decide whether this criteria is met because um, it's not a clear criteria. So some of those have been identified. I expect there are a lot of code criteria that um, it just, we just haven't noticed that it's not clear and objective, but some cities will do a um, clear and objective code audit where they hire a someone who's more of an expert than me on clear and objective code um, to come in and go through your whole development code and pick out the pieces that are not clear and objective and propose some changes that would make it more clear and objective. So that's something we could do. Okay. I'm gonna keep moving on down the list. Sure. Um, the next item on the list is um, annexation approval processing criteria. Right now, we treat annexations as a land use decision. That means it, it annexations are regulated within our development code. So any change that we want to make to the annexation rules um, has to go through the whole development code amendment process. And similar to comp plan amendments, the state has to approve those amendments. Um, but I learned recently that annexations don't have to be land use decisions. Some cities do not treat them as land use decisions. They park those regulations outside of their development code. And when they do that, um, they are subject to fewer of the state land use requirements, right? And so you, a lot of you have heard over and over again that the state imposes all these land use laws that kind of limit what we're allowed to do and what we're allowed to approve or deny. Um, and so annexations are one of those types of land use decisions where currently, because it's a, um, it's a development code review process, we are subject to the state law related to residential development. A bunch of our annexation criteria are not legally applicable as a land use decision, but we can remove that from our development code and apply my understanding, and we should confirm all of this with the city attorney, um, but I expect we could apply more discretionary criteria to those decisions. So we, I think, could require um, you know, school and fire district capacity, which currently we're not allowed to um, to require that as a condition of annexation approval. So things like that, um, that would involve doing research into the legal, you know, what would be legal for us to require and then what would you all and the city council want to change if we did take that out of our development code and park it somewhere else in our code where we have more um, discretion on approving annexations, if that's something that the city wants to do, which it has sounded like, sometimes it sounds like that is something the city would like. So it's on the list. <clears throat> as I understand it, as the planning commission as a whole, if they're inside the uh, city urban growth boundary, unless there's, there's never been a denial of an annexation, for us, we have if they meet the criteria, we have no grounds to stand on to deny their application. Right. So what I just heard from you was a whole bunch of, well, how did that tornado get going? We have to, we're we're bound by a set of guidelines that, for some reason, they haven't met it, and we haven't found it. It's going to get passed, and so I I you know. I was in lieu when we took in 160 some acres all in one shot. I was in shock. I thought, good grief. But it made sense for all of the stakeholders for a one time shot and everybody join in that wanted to, which left us with a few islands out here. Now, if I'm wrong, you correct me. I would, I, that sounds right. 
But I think what we're saying is, is we've got the opportunity to address that criteria. Yeah, I just didn't want to make it more difficult than what I just heard. <laughs> Ben's wheels are turning over there. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to figure out. What, well, I won't, I won't go down the rabbit trail. Like, why why would we deny an annexation application? Um, if, for example, if there was a concern that there wasn't enough, um, that the fire district wouldn't be able to serve the future development. Currently, because it's because annexation regulations are parked in our development code, um, that criteria, which is not clear and objective, um, and this this applies to residential land, the clear and objective requirement, and all of the annexations we've had have been residential land. Um, so currently, we're not allowed to consider fire district capacity in annexations. But if we take our I my understanding, and so we'd want to, it would involve researching into this, is that if we take our annexation criteria out of the development code, put it somewhere else, um, there are still state requirements for annexations, but it, it is not the state land use. It's not under the state land use regulation. So um, then we could impose requirements like you know, the city is allowed to deny an annexation application if they're concerned that there's not enough fire district capacity to serve the future residents or school district capacity or, you know, these other districts that are um, completely out of the city's control. Currently, um, basically the criteria that we're allowed to apply are wastewater, water, um, you know, things that are within the city's jurisdictional authority to control. All right. Did you have another? Well, I, he hit or you hit on the on the the only reasons we could, and that's we're at capacity for our sewer. We don't have enough water to spread it to any more houses, and for we've got a school that's already filled up, and we can't back. You know, we're not going to build anything new in the next year with 150 new students coming. You know, we're, I don't think we can use that one, although it should be. Okay. Yeah. So something to maybe look into. And, you know, once again, that will be a, there's all the research involved. We'll want to look at what other cities do. Um, if, uh, if they're, whichever other cities treat annexations as non-land use decisions, we'd want to look at, kind of look into how that's working for them. Have they had, are there repercussions to that that we would need to consider? Um, and then go through the whole development code amendment process to take that out of the code. So it would be a bit of a process, but um, it might be worth it if, if that would, you know, uh, resolve some concerns or you know kind of provide a little more local control over the way that the growth is happening. The third one on the list is child care facilities, which maybe we don't need to talk about because we just did. Yep. Um, the fourth one is that park space requirement that doesn't currently exist. It says something in our code like developers are encouraged but not required to provide park space in the subdivision. So um, We've heard from that, that one right there kind of hits me at home because we had a at one time, I'm gonna say 25 years ago or more, and we had a 20 acre parcel up here. They wanted to break it down into 9.96 and 9.85 or whatever it was. You never may remember this. And they made it in two parts, but it was one 20 acre parcel. And at that time, if you had 20 acres, you brought it in, you building it out, you had to provide X amount of park space or playground space. And they did so up there on Reagan, Reagan Hill Heights. Um, there was, well, I helped build the facility and the, the fences around it. But that seems to have got lost in translation, translation moving through the process. And Tom Sager and I both knew it. But when you said that it 
not in there anymore. We thought, well, when did that happen? Mm -hmm. We were on the council for 12 or 14 years and we never saw it go away. But so that's something we can revisit to yeah. add a requirement like that in there again. And so with, when 160 acres or whatever it was, more than that, came in, I thought, holy cow, okay, so that's how many 20 acre parks? None. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away. Mm -hmm. I, I too would like to support furthering that conversation when the joint uh, council meets for two reasons. Really, it sounds like recently as I uh, read the newspaper that the city council was engaged by uh, the most recent development because of their disapproval of the plan um, of what was intended with pickleball courts and other things into that, which I think ultimately led to the city's decision uh, to move away from that. Am I saying that correctly? Um, Campanella yeah, states. Correct, yeah. And I would imagine that they they had the, the right and opportunity to do that because there was a lack of clarity in what stipulates green space and parks inside of that, which allowed the which made the city council vulnerable to a judgment call because of lack of policy that was created. And correct me if I'm wrong in that, but it puts you guys in a tough spot because of the inability through policy uh, to rely on that. Um, and then secondly, I would like to have that conversation too, because from the school district perspective, uh, any type of athletic activity, be that softball, baseball, basketball, youth football, and soccer, there is no capacity other than what the school district possesses uh, for children to engage in that play. And we are exceeding capacity in baseball and softball. Our four gyms are maxed until really 9, 30, 10 o'clock every single night. Um, I'm sure that you'll start to receive in the future complaints of stadium lights being on on our new turf field until nine o'clock just because of a capacity issue. And so I think it would be the council, the cities, and the district's best interest to have a conversation about what park space should and would look like. And so when the new development comes in, whenever that comes, that there are stipulations that a baseball field or softball size field or, or some type of athletic fields are also incorporated inside those subdivisions because right now there is no space um, for that. And, um, that would be an innovative way for us to approach that. And it would support the city council and being able to rely on policies so you're not beholden to people who just don't like pickleball or the sound. <laughs> yeah, pun intended. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I mean, our, the code, the codes um, sort of flimsy reference or encouragement for parks doesn't even really address, I mean, you you kind of brought up a good point there. It um, doesn't address much at all, if anything, about like sports fields, right? A athletic fields. And that's something that could be, um, could be provided for, or, you know, just left open park or sports field space or similar facilities, something like that, but um, yeah. But that clarity, then I promise to stop, but then, but that clarity, is critical because all along we knew that there was going to be a splash pad and other things that were designed for that specific park. And once the people moved into those houses, it was their determination that they didn't want it. And so we had to go back on what the ultimate vision is, creating a sacrifice of what goes into Wade Creek Park, where it would be to the city and commission's best interest for us to stipulate what that looks like. So then ultimately, when you moved in, you knew that this was going to take place. Mm -hmm. I don't think they took it. They didn't take away the open space. Correct. They just took away the, I think they had facilities, swing sets, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. And the pickleball courts. And, right. You know. <clears throat> yeah. But you're right. If you pin it down, then it's done. Then it's easy. Then it's yeah. easy. <clears throat> yeah. Any other parks thoughts? Okay. Um, 
the next one. Adopting consistent wetland and creek buffers throughout the city. Um, currently, we only have in, in two of the newer zones, in the North City Residential Zone and in the Outdoor Commercial Zone, we do have a creek buffer for Curran Creek. So in those zones, no development is allowed within 70 feet of the mean high water line or something like that. Um, that is the only riparian or wetland buffer development prohibition that we have, period. We have a, a quote unquote wetlands over, I mean, we have a wetlands overlay adopted into our code that um, does not prohibit any, it just says the city will identify where the wetlands are, but it doesn't prohibit any development near those wetlands, right? And so there's just not, other than those two zones, there's not any um, any standards for how close do we want to allow development to the creek? Um, what restrictions on like the types of uses might we want to impose around the creek? Um, and presumably, if you have that buffer adopted in one zone, it's it's the same creek when you cross the zone boundary, right? Um, and so looking at do we want to expand those buffers, just make them citywide? And are there other um, wetland or creek related um, kind of policies or restrictions that we want to look at? I think it can kind of be looked at like the childcare system or uh, issue is the state already has wetland delineations and different stream types. So I, I don't know if we need to go into specific zones, like you can be 70 feet in this zone, but only 45 in this zone. Whereas if we just say this is a type one fish bearing stream or a, a winter time only creek, that's not the official term, but it they have different levels. Seasonal. Seasonal, thank you. Um, that we would create barrier buffers based on the stream type. Mm -hmm. um, it's like the forest practices in any of the private timber grounds, they have buffers that they have to be away from the creek that they can log, how, how close they can log to. And, and it depends on the size of the stream and what type of fish and endangered species and everything else. So um, I think it, rather than diving in and putting it in each separate code section, just going and figuring out how those affect us. Mm -hmm. Clackamas River is gonna have a different buffer than current creek. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then the wetland part of it, Obviously, we know where they are. And then there's the wetland banks. Is that right? Where you can buy a piece of ground elsewhere and say, oh, well, oh. this is in the city limits that's and we're going to develop it into industrial. But we have this piece over here in Eagle Creek that's got ducks on it. And so we're going to call that our wetland bank. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, kind of like carbon credits uh -huh. on, the, can, on the federal yeah. level. You can but do I don't want to get into that, but I mean... But those are the types of things like rather than us diving into the minutia and the code, just rely on something that already exists and say type one stream is this, make it consistent. Mm -hmm. But it's something that needs to be addressed so we don't have to talk about it every time. Right. Hey y'all, uh, I need to bow out. It felt rude to just leave without saying goodbye, but um, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Thank right, you for your care. child care input and the new maps. Of course, of course. See you. Bye. <clears throat> um, okay, the next one is about lighting regulations. We've gotten complaints, um, a variety of types of complaints about lighting, whether it's street lights um, or lights on the sides of buildings that are shining in the people's yards. Um, and part of the issue is, you know, just creating light pollution. The other part is um, like visibility and safety concerns. If your street lights aren't um, properly hooded, then it, they can create glare, which make, actually reduces vis visibility. And so a lot of cities have um, standards related to city, you know, public 
lighting, so the lights that are actually in the right of way. And some cities also have standards for private properties, you know, that have to hood or shade their lights that are facing out into the right of way. Um, and so that's something that we added to the list. We've gotten a few complaints over the past year or two about lighting issues. And also looking at, I mean, something that we're already looking at with the TSP, for example, is what parts of the city are lacking in any street lighting altogether. So that's something we could include in that exploration. I'm just gonna keep going down this list and you should all feel free to interrupt me. Um, storage standards, we've been having issues with like those Connex storage containers being positioned, placed on properties and we don't have clear code um, to deal with it. And so that's an issue that comes up in code enforcement a lot. Our code enforcement officer will notice that a Connex storage box has been placed on a property. Um, they need to find out whether it was permitted to be placed there, whether it's even allowed to be placed there by the zone. Is it considered outdoor storage that's unenclosed storage, or do we consider it enclosed because it's a container? Um, and so this is an issue that lots of other cities have code on, and we we have a little bit of code, but it doesn't go far enough. So it's something we need to figure out primarily for code enforcement. Is this on behalf of it that some of them may be covered in graffiti and they're an attract, unattractive nuisance? That's something to consider when you're deciding what I to mean, allow. I mean, I love them myself. I mean, but uh, <laughs> right. I don't know if I'm going to put one in the backyard just to cover up my garbage. Right. <clears throat> um. Food carts, um, we're, we really need, I hope that there's no issue with this. We really need to require food carts to renew their licenses every year, just like we require annual business license renewals. We're running into tons of issues with food cart licensing because they're not annual. For some reason, when food cart, when the food cart chapter got adopted into the code, I wasn't here, um, they decided to require a two-year renewal and it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't happen at the beginning of the year it happens two years from the time they submitted their application so it's been a nightmare to track and there have been other um you know issues complaints um primarily complaints about food carts um it just sounds like there are um maybe some standards that uh, the council and maybe you all would be interested in updating or changing relating to where food carts are allowed to be placed, how close can they be to X, are they allowed to have a generator, or do they have to, right, so just looking at all those kind of nitty gritty food cart details, taking a, taking a revisit. Are you to, picking on the generator? I'm not picking on anything, except the two-year renewal, we don't like that. Um, so yeah, you want them in a timely manner at the first of the year, so you don't have to deal with them year round. Well, it's it's really because the business license issuance, like they depend on each other. We can't issue one without issuing the other, and yeah. So I'll leave it there. Administrative stuff. Common sense. Yeah. Um, so the next one is RV covers and carport standards. We just don't have standards for this type of structure. And so when someone wants to build one or alter one, um, that has been an issue with code enforcement primarily. Um, I mentioned the code contradictions. What I gave the example of the zone that allows, I think it's maybe self-storage facilities are, or drive-throughs are, are allowed as a conditional use in one of the zones. And they're also listed as a pro prohibited use, right? So if someone applied for a conditional use permit for that, for a drive-through, we would have, I think we would have to accept that application and the planning commission would have to decide whether it was actually a prohibited use, right? It, it, that's wonky. We should make sure not to have that kind of contradiction in there. The next one is um, adopting an airport plan and airport zone code. The airport plan, it doesn't have to be a separate plan. It would just be a component of our comprehensive plan. It would just be adopting policies. We would probably just copy what the county has because it's the same exact airport that's currently, it's the Valley View Airport that's within the county's jurisdiction. Um, and some of you might remember maybe about a year ago, 
we had an annexation application for a property that was outside of city limits. It was designated on our comp plan map for airport zoning to get applied upon annexation, but we don't have airport zoning to match that comp plan designation. Um, and then go. Where did it go? Exactly. Where did we we, we never. Yes, we did. You I would love to see did. it. With the parks. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, made, do they, have made, one. they made a dead zone for building as a flight taken off and coming in because it was vulnerable to have somebody land on your roof if you built. We did that 25 years ago. Well, it, it, that exists on the on the south end of the runway. A big mound of dirt. There's a, there's is the no, is the no, of dirt. Yeah. Well, they, they, that's why it's theirs. They, that's nobody that, can build there. Canyon. Yeah. Yeah. But you remember adopting an airport zone, developing. You Bob know. Vealy was the one in, uh -huh. in charge of that. He wanted it. Who yeah. was that? Bob Vealy owned the airport at that time. Oh. Hmm. Then he moved he away bought, and bought the one right else to get it. And we looked at him like, really? Yeah, he hammered it down. Well, I guess we'll we look for have. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, had, we had people from uh, all of the FFA and all kinds of letters behind their name and in front. <laughs> he was. It is amazing to me that you don't have this in your files or computer somewhere. Yeah, I oh, will like double check. The, it's on our list. The, yeah. What's the park out there? Oh, you yeah. better run. We're get, We're going to be the next hit, guys. Uh -huh. <laughs> we made that uh, re-elected. Do you have like a range of, do you know what year that whole conversation yeah. was? Well, it would be Bob Bealey's name and see when he come to town. It was. It would have been 95, 96. I'm going to say yeah. after 95, because that's when Tom and I got into this mess. <laughs> and he was in planning before that. And he was he, buying the airport. He owned the airport. He owned the airport. The airport. He, he built the housing up there and the whole nine yards. Uh -huh. And so he, there were a bunch of public meetings when he was building the housing up there? Beverly Beely was still alive. You should call her. She lives over in Brineville. B-E-L-E-Y. Yeah, I'm just, it wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have had to do anything through the city because it's not within city limits. But it was in our urban growth boundary. Hmm. Okay, yeah. I'll <laughs> see what I can find. Sorry about that. And if I can't find anything, we... Anyway, we need to we need to make sure that something is adopted meeting the state requirement. We ran into this issue last year where we have failed to meet this state requirement to adopt an airport plan, just the policies and um, you know development code attached to the designation. Oh, man. It was a long drawn out process. That hurts. Yeah, yeah. But what happens? Um, the state will not allow you to approve at land use decisions for a property that is affected by the airport zone designation if you have not met the requirement of adopting the zoning code related to that or adopting the policies related to that airport. So we have not adopted the zoning code. I think. I mean, maybe maybe we'll find it somewhere. And it's. But, I hope um, you do. You make me smile if you do. So we ran into this issue with this property that was zone that was designated for airport uses. They were coming into city limits. They weren't part of the airport, so we don't really know why they were designated airport. They should have been changed when they partitioned off. Um, but they were still designated airport and they wanted to come into city limits and zone change. That's a land use application. They wanted to change their zone to low density residential, just like all of the properties around it. And that made total sense to us. And we also thought, well, that's great. We don't have any airport zone to apply to this property. So if you want a zone change to a zone that we do have, that solves a problem for the city too. 
Um, but the Department of Aviation, you know, for, for that type of application, you have to send notice to the state because you're amending your comprehensive plan map. Um, about three years ago. And it was like, it was like a year ago. A year ago? It's fresh and was three years it was traumatic. Um, COVID. The, the Department of Aviation got word of that application because it was airport related and they um, contacted me to let us know we're not supposed to allow a zone change to residential and there's all these reasons why, although they weren't, ODA, the Department of Aviation, was not able to point to what um, state law prohibited us from approving that land use decision. And neither was DLCD, which is the state Department of Land Conservation and Development, basically the state planning department. Like those were my two state resources that I was just trying to get a clear answer. Can we approve this annexation? Can we approve the zone change? If you're saying no, please show me the, the state statute that prohibits us from approving it. Because if we deny it, the applicant's going to probably appeal us, take us to the Land Use Board of Appeals. And then if we lose that, then the city is you know, out however much that lawsuit costs. Um, so we were just in a really tight spot because we hadn't met the state requirement, but they weren't able to tell us which one. Anyway, we went through the hearings, we got it approved, it's fine. But we found out after the fact that um, we found out where the state, that state statute prohibiting us from approving land use applications. Is that the one that part of the property located. was outside of the, the safety zone? Yes. Okay. So if anyone wants to know more about that, there's too many details about Denise all of the Tracy rules that went into right. that. Is Tracy still that. with the city or is he retired? For, a, for like a month well, more, her she's her still here. Month. Maybe she would remember, I'll ask. <laughs> She was involved in it. Big time. Obviously, mm -hmm. obviously Denise is, uh, she's retired, so. Yeah, so but Denise she, she was here. Denise was, part of it. Denise was here for this, and she did not seem to think that we had airport zone <laughs> zoning <laughs> regulations. Denise is the I think Tom and uh, Richard want to come down and talk to you tomorrow about this. Yeah, yeah. okay, I'll let's go, keep I going. <laughs> Yeah, we're close Sign tomorrow. Um, all right, moving on. Sign standards and permitting process. Our sign code is a mess. This is another one that's like mostly an administrative um, fix that we need for our internal process, but also an opportunity if we're updating the code anyway. Are there concerns or complaints about the way that signs look in the city? And if so, um, we could address those as we update the sign <laughs> code. Are we talking billboards or just regular street signs? Any signs. Any and all. Well, any and all signs. Excuse me. The next that I'll put something up for tomorrow. <laughs> the next one is um, marijuana issues. Um, we have been having complaints um, about marijuana odor out in the industrial park and our odor control standards are not necessarily easy to apply. So we're looking at updating those standards so that it's, once again, this is kind of an internal uh, thing, but updating those standards so that it's easier for code enforcement or our building official or the fire marshal to go out there and have the legal authority to inspect, et cetera. Aren't right. Um, and so in the meantime, once again, if we're going in and updating that code, are there any other changes to the marijuana regulations that you want to look at? Um, the next one is, I don't know anything about this item. <laughs> this I think came from our code enforcement officer wanting to look at garage sale code the definition, the permit process. Um, there are also building code updates that the state is requiring jurisdictions to make. And then there are some recommended building code updates. We usually just defer to whatever Northwest code professionals and the state um, building codes division. Um, we tend to defer to them for all things building. But if there are specific building codes that we want to adopt in addition to what the state requires, we can look at those. But I don't have any 
recommendations there. Um, looking at fencing in the industrial zone. I think this one, um, Melanie was talking about how in the industrial zone, there's currently an allowance where you, you can have, you can have unenclosed, so outdoor storage, accessory to your industrial use um, if it is screened from the right-of-way. And so screening is, you know, you block the view of the thing from the right-of-way. Um, but that allowance for accessory, unenclosed outdoor storage prohibits slatted chain link fencing. And so we've had complaints from some of the users out there. They, they wanna screen their outdoor storage, um, but they're not allowed to use slatted chain link fencing. And I don't know why, but that's currently prohibited. So Reba's in- Take the drive around the phone company, my house, anybody at the school, you're gonna find slats, you're gonna find chain link, am I right? Right, and those are all outside of the industrial zone. So they're what allowed. What would be the difference? Right. It's just in the, that's the that's, that's kind of the, the argument the is why do we prohibit it here, but we don't prohibit it anywhere else? I I think it's probably prohibited in the downtown zone because we've got downtown design requirements. Language but actually, state. I'm not sure. So something to look at. Um, the next one is large vehicles and RVs parked in the right of way. Again, this didn't come from my department, but I guess we've been having issues with RVs about four days being parked. I, I'm not sure what the rule is right now. That sounds right, 72 hours. Um, unlawful camping and derelict housing. Yeah, so these ones towards the end didn't come from my team, so I can't say much about them, but these would be, um, actually these ones towards the end, these are much easier code amendments to make because they don't have to go to the state um, through the development code amendment process. So it would just be a council decision. And then board member ethics, ADU standards. I don't remember why that one was on this list. ADU is accessory dwelling unit. And we did just update some of the ADU related standards with our housing amendments. Um, so maybe that one is just still on the list as a vestigial item. Um, fire related building and development code amendments. This came up, um, this is like uh, wildfire related um, changes. So are there building code or development code changes that we could make to reduce the um, vulnerability of our structures, the vulnerability to wildfire risk? basically. We say no. What's that? I just say no. Sure. <laughs> well, it, it's all in the building codes. Didn't the state of Oregon address this? Like, weren't they changing some standards? And so, then they got a bunch of lawsuits filed against them and they pulled back on it. So it's something mm -hmm. we don't even want to wait into. Okay. This well, might have come about the last one here. here. They, had a, they had the whole wildfire overlay that they did and everybody's oh, insurance yeah. went through the roof uh -huh. for a minute. And all the insurance companies said, you can't do this. So that's why everybody's pulling back on it. And the state said, pump the brakes. And now everybody's off. Right. And then anything outside of a city is in the uh, wildland urban interface. And it has specific standards you have to do, which are related to the state planning standards, like EFU and timber zones, any of the bigger ag forestry zoning types have specific setbacks, uh, fire sprinklers sometimes, metal roofs. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff, right? Doesn't Which belong in the city. Sense here. Doesn't right. belong in the city municipal building code. Mm -hmm. One thing um, that would be a development would involve the development code indirectly um, is that with our TSP transportation system plan update, we are going to look at um, evacuation routes. And so, when you identify a certain route or a certain project in your TSP, that means that when a subdivision comes in for development, they have to dedicate enough right of way in order to provide for that facility to get built. So that's just one, one small thing that ultimately comes in with development. <laughs> Sounds like maybe the building related. I guess we can leave it on the list and if somebody has any questions, I, I'm glad to yeah. chime in on it. 
yeah, we should probably, I think that that, um, I think that Elena, the assistant city manager, and maybe she was working with Alan on this. I'm not sure, but I know that Elena was um, involved with something related to wildfire, which I could say more. Okay. Um, tree planting requirements and or protections for certain existing trees. I think this came up in a council meeting recently. So we added it to the list. Um, and then flagpole lot code standards and setback requirements. We've had some development on flagpole lots where um, it's the developer wanted to orient the house kind of sideways and it did make, you know, it makes sense to us for the site, but we don't have clear code on requiring the house to face a certain way. And is there a preference on the planning commission or the council for there to be orientation standards for flagpole lots? And that is the non-exhaustive list of code issues that some of which you might wanna discuss with the city council. And if there's any more, um, yeah, if you wanna talk about any of that further, any of the things that I do know about, uh, we're happy to talk to you whenever, whenever we're working. Um, and we won't be at city hall tomorrow, but next week. So I'd like to say one thing. Go ahead. You've done a magnificent job getting us through this. Is that it? Couldn't, couldn't do it. Couldn't do it without my planning staff buddies. So, so we so we just went through twenty three pretty big ticket items. I don't think there's any way that if, when you get us and city council together that we're going to be able to go through twenty three big ticket items in anything less than an eight hour day. Right. So maybe we should, um, and I'm just floating this out here, maybe put together a list of like rank the top five mm -hmm. and see which ones kind of float up. And maybe we attack those five and then we can kind of revisit yeah. in time down the road or maybe it's, I don't know what the magical number is. But... Those to you or... Yeah. I mean, would, if any of you would be, feel prepared to just circle your top five right now we could <laughs> take your paper <laughs> otherwise yeah we could um follow up you think five's a reasonable a number week or so? six eight let's start 23 and some of them like we can kind of squeeze that Nine. but i think some of them are worthy of an hour discussion in themselves yeah yeah okay so to clarify your homework is um, <laughs> rank your the top five issues from that code issue list that you hope to talk about at the joint workshop with the city council. And if there's something that's not on that list that you would like to talk about, just write, you can do write in. Right? <laughs> okay. Oh, there was another thing. I can't remember if we put this on your agenda. I wanted to check with you all about your next meeting, the timing. Um, your regular February meeting would be scheduled for it's the fourth Thursday. So it would be Thursday, February 23rd. Um, we don't actually have any land use applications submitted. I'll get one. So, And if we needed a 20 day notice, I don't think they'll have a meeting because no, okay, you're not gonna have a meeting on the 23rd. You'll just have the joint workshop on the 27th, unless you want to, unless you wanna have a planning commission meeting on the 23rd nope. to discuss, you know, to have discussions like we did tonight. But um, for our new for our new people, usually uh, planning commission meetings involve one or more public hearings on a land use application or a public hearing on a code amendment or a comprehensive plan amendment, right? It's usually a public hearing and sometimes there's other types of discussion. So tonight was a little unique in that aspect, but there's no, there's no public hearing that will happen at your next, that would, ha that would have happened on the 23rd. So we can go ahead and- so what time is the 27th joint? Um, 
it's That's happening okay. instead of their, I believe it's, we're planning on that meeting to happen instead of their regular meeting, but maybe, maybe it's we still, can still start it earlier. It's still yeah. Monday then? No, no, no. The joint workshop meeting on the 27th. Is that a Monday? Yeah, it's a Monday. Oh, it's a Monday. Yeah, it's a it's, oh, you can get back to, uh, it's on that, it looks like it's yeah. at seven. I'm going to confirm that. Would would you all be, would you all prefer or not prefer for it to start at six? Is that worse for anyone if it started at six on a Monday? I like seven, but, seven, three. but I can handle it. Sounds like okay. seven o'clock. Majority rule. Yeah. Okay. So we'll push for. Seven o'clock on February Monday, February twenty seventh, and we'll send out reminders. And no planning commission meeting on the twenty third. We will also send you a reminder about that. Not to be too picky, but could you send us, like, in a pretty easy format of the top twenty four or twenty three, that we can just reply individually to Ryan and you? Yes. So we'll email you that list of code issues and then we'll remind you the prompt please pick your let us know what your top five are ideally you would rank them like my most important issue is number one okay. next most important number two and I'll put this all in the email and then we'll also remind you if there's anything not on the list that you know you want to discuss please let us know that too um, and then we'll include the reminder about your regular meeting being canceled and your upcoming joint workshop. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. everybody.